Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, Nirvana series number eight. Oh yeah, I got a little plug on Social Blade in here I want to show to you guys. It's about the channel before we get started. Hope you enjoy. Thank you to all the members. Roll credits at the end. Thanks all the members. This channel would not be possible without you. For anyone who is curious about their favorite YouTubers analytics, you can go to this cool website called Social Blade and just type type their username in up here. You can see I've done mine. Uh, 1106 uploads, 5150 subscribers, 1,378,000 views. You can see that I've been doing it since March 16th, 2017. And, it, and here's what's really cool. At my subscriber count, most YouTube channels with with around 5,000 subscribers are rated a C minus to a C. My channel's actually rated a B. So that's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm proud of that. And as well, you can see it says I make $99 to 1.6K a month. Now that's an average. It fluctuates. It you know obviously if you get way more views in a particular month, this number is going to shoot up. That's what happened to me. The month of December, it shot way up, but I didn't get that money because I gotta pay. You know I gotta pay for those clips I use. So being a member helps me to sustain my life. I'm not getting rich. I'm literally, you're literally helping me live. What really irks me, and there's one more thing I wanted to show you guys. What really irks me is when YouTubers that you know are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, if not millions, are begging for those $1 donations. It's like, really? You really need that one extra dollar? If you're curious how much your favorite YouTuber is making, go to Social Blade. One more thing I'm very proud of that I'd like to share with you. Two months, 7,000. Four months, 11,000. All the way up to a year, 41,000 subscribers. And they're not always the most accurate, but I've noticed that with my channel, they've been pretty accurate. Like, so that gives me a lot of hope. One year from now, I'm going to be at 52,000 subscribers. So if you want to get in on the ground level of a of an upcoming YouTube channel, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. If, if you want some extra stuff, some extra perks behind the scenes, extra content, early access, hit that join button and become a member. All right, here we go. Nirvana number eight extended cut. Now this isn't just more added to the end. There's also going to be stuff filled in in the middle too. So you're going to want to watch uh, so you don't miss anything that I've plugged in to where it needs to be. Save the American icon, Tom. Next, when rock and roll singer Kurt Cobain committed suicide, few question the official ruling, but private investigator Tom Grant is convinced that the truth about Cobain's death has yet to be revealed. I don't believe Kurt Cobain committed suicide. I believe there was someone with him in that room. I believe it was someone that he knew. They were doing heroin together. I believe at a certain point, more heroin was injected into Kurt Cobain than what he wanted injected into himself. The Kurt Cobain episode on Unsolved Mysteries first aired in February of 1997. I remember watching it come on TV and it just flooring me. I was drumming in a high school band at the time. We had learned how to play our instruments by listening to Nirvana songs. Nirvana and Green Day pretty much taught us how to play our instruments. And when we saw this on Unsolved Mysteries, we were like, there's got to be something to this. Unsolved Mysteries doesn't just air anything. There's got to be some evidence backing up this conspiracy. And you might ask, well, why wasn't it reinvestigated? Why did nothing happen? How could something like this be on such a credible crime fighting television show and nothing come of it? And there's a simple answer for that. The Seattle Police Department has full authority over this investigation. If they say that it's shut, 
and it doesn't need to be reopened, that it was a suicide, there's nobody who can override them unless the federal government stepped in, unless the FBI stepped in. And as far as the FBI is concerned, they got bigger fish to fry. It's going to take a Seattle police chief, someone very high up in the food chain on the Seattle Police Department to want to really get to the heart of that case until anything happens. This is this case is not going to go away. It hasn't gone away for 20 years. There will come a point where somebody's going to step in and uh, have a conscience and do the right thing. So that's why it's important for you and I to keep talking about this case. It might be 20, 30 years from now. Courtney Love, Callie DeWitt, Jessica Hopper, Dylan Carlson, all those people, they might be long gone before someone in that food chain on the Seattle Police Department finally steps up to the plate and says, I wanna solve this case. Right now, it's all about pride. They do not want to admit that they were wrong and that there was a lot of corruption going on in the Seattle Police Department, which we will be talking about in this episode. For right now, I wanna to stick to the timeline when we get April 5th, 1994. So when we left off, we were on April 4th. We talked about Jessica Hopper and Callie DeWitt's conflicting stories. And we also talked about Jessica being questioned, I believe in 2015, like 21 years later, and how she had a bit of a freak out. Let's move forward to the next day. We all know what day that is, the day that Kurt Cobain dies. Whether he really did take his own life, whether you think he took his own life or whether you think someone did it, whether maybe you think it was an assisted kind of suicide, we lost the most simplistic yet genius singer-songwriter of all time, in my opinion, on April 5th, 1994. Tom Grant notes something peculiar on April 5th that doesn't prove anything, but sure raises a lot of suspicion. And that is how quiet Courtney Love is being. Over the last two days, April 3rd and April 4th, he had been in constant contact with Courtney Love, whether it be by phone or whether he was sitting in her hotel room at the peninsula. Suddenly on April 5th, not only has Courtney not contacted him, he can't even get her to return phone calls. He ends up going to her hotel room to talk with her because he can't get a hold of her. So what was Courtney doing on April the 5th, the same day that Kurt Cobain is said to have died? We, you know, it's estimated that he died in the early morning, maybe sunrise. I think that's very romantic, you know? I think a lot of people, it's like, there's even a YouTube video that was commissioned by Courtney Love, by the way, that's trying to convince you he killed himself. And it says at sunrise, he had to kill himself, like a vampire or something, you know what I mean? I'm really sorry, you guys. I don't know what I could have done. Something good can come out of Kurt's death. I don't know what it is yet, but something good can. Something good can. She actually was showing his suicide note to fans, talking to people, weeping, crying, lighting candles. It truly was one of the most extraordinary public displays of grief you will ever see in your life. What do we know Courtney was up to that day? She sent Eric Erlinson to the Lake Washington house to look for Kurt. Now that's interesting, and this is something Tom Grant and the rest of the world, the rest of us, only find out much later. If you knew that Callie and Jessica were there, right? Because Jessica doesn't leave till the 6th, Callie doesn't leave until the 7th, why would you send a third person there, right? It, what's, what's the point? She tells Tom, Callie will tell me if Kurt comes around. This is where things get a little confusing. And by the way, Kristen Foff, Courtney's bassist, who ended up dead of a drug over, a supposed drug overdose only two months after Kurt, the last person to see her was Eric Erlinson. okay? So not only was Eric Erlinson present on April 5th, the day we know Kurt died, he was also present on the evening before Kristen Pfaff is found. Erlinson had dated Courtney. He, he was in love with Courtney. Courtney left Erlinson for Billy Corgan, who in turn left him for Kurt Cobain. Erlinson 
then becomes romantically involved with Kristen Foff, who later says that she only got with him because he was the only dude that she knew when she moved to Seattle to start playing with the band Hole, and she just felt lonely. And guess what? It's noticed by everyone in the inner circle that Kurt and Kristen Falk are giving each other eyes. Constantly. Quote from Courtney Love to Kristen Falk. You fuck my guitar player, constantly make eyes at my husband, and now you're telling me how to sing. Just don't fuck with me, because you'll regret it forever. Kurt gives her one of his favorite books, his favorite book. He buys her a copy of Patrick Suskin's Perfume, gives it to her as a present. This infuriates Courtney, who knows that she will... See, Kristen was a studied musician. She actually studied music. Courtney just banged on her guitar and played power chords. She basically wasn't a musician at all. That's why, that's, that's why she was attracted to punk rock. It doesn't take a whole lot of talent if you can make a whole lot of noise. Kurt and Kristen were up here way up here. Courtney Love's musicianship was way down here. Way down there alongside Eric Erlinson. She, Courtney Love knew that she could never be Kristen Pfaff. I call her Pfaff. I know it's Paff or Faff or whatever. I just, I think Pfaff sounds cooler. And one more thing of note, even when Live Through This comes out the week after Kurt's death, all the reviews are pointed toward Kristen saying, ooh, who's that new bassist? Have you heard her, her Vo her backup vocals man she really gives whole a whole new sound their only album that really got any mainstream attention everybody was crediting Kristen Pfaff not Courtney Love the singer of the band the front woman of the band you know judging by Courtney's personality her entire life wanting nothing more but that spotlight to be on her and what a great musician she was that spotlight shifted a little bit to her right, to her bassist. Add to this that it was rumored that they had spent nights together at one of the cabins in Carnation, Washington. Dylan Carlson later reveals that Kurt had told him what a beautiful, talented musician that Kurt thought Kristen Pfaff was. And as we're going to learn in this episode, Dylan speaks to Courtney behind Kurt's back and even takes commands from Courtney. Now, Kurt had confided in Dylan as a friend saying, I've got a crush on Courtney's basis. If she ever finds out, she'll kill me. Keep this between us. Erlinson was jealous of Kurt Cobain. Not only one woman had basically left him and ended up with Kurt, but here was a second woman leaving him, making eyes at Kurt Cobain. Eric Erlinson never stopped trying to be with Kristen. It got to the point where she literally had to tell him, I'm quitting the band, leave me the fuck alone. Courtney Love was facing a divorce from Kurt Cobain. Not only do you have these jealousies of the, the two people that Eric and Courtney want to be with, don't want to be with them, they also want to be with each other. And how many times has love and money been a motive for murder? He was present at both deaths. I had a crazy, my great grandmother, the, my great grandmother was this crazy redneck lady from Kentucky. Kentucky or Virginia, I, I can't remember. And she lived to be almost 100 years old. And she had a saying, she was a wildcat. So keep that in mind. She said, let me try to remember. It was one coincidence smells fishy, two coincidences, someone's getting fucked. If I had to, to point fingers, I would point fingers at Eric Erlinson. Kurt Cobain was a better guitarist than Eric, which is what he wanted to be. He was a better singer-songwriter. Kurt Cobain got all the women that Eric wanted, all the fame that Eric wanted. Courtney Love. Kristen was a better guitarist, a better singer, was becoming more famous than Courtney. When their album Live Through This comes out, all the articles are starting to be written about Kristen. And guess what? Kristen's the one woman that Kurt Cobain wants. Eric and Courtney can never top Kristen and Kurt. They're never going to be better than them. They become, they become 
panicked when they finally realize that these people they're obsessing over not only don't want to be with them but want to be with each other they realize what it's going to do to their careers and their pockets they can no longer ride kurt cobain's coattails Kristen will more than likely move beyond Courtney's stature because she can actually play guitar and she can actually sing. And it's going to make Courtney and Eric nothing but a side note in the history of rock and roll. They realize that if Kurt dies before it's publicly known that a divorce was coming, that he was moving on to another relationship, that he will die with everybody thinking he loved them and thought of them as amazing fellow musicians. Not only that, Courtney Love becomes executor of the Cobain estate because he dies before he can get to his attorney, Rosemary Carroll, and sign his new will, in which he had asked her to remove Courtney Love's name. Just a quick interjection in my own video. Now, it's common knowledge that Rosemary Carroll tells Tom Grant that Kurt had called her from Rome asking for the removal of Courtney Love from his will. But the more I dug into it, I realized that that's, that's a false statement. I think it's something we all believe, including myself, until I was researching this video. Turns out, Kurt Cobain had no will. He had never made one. Therefore, in my opinion, he wasn't planning on dying anytime soon. He was a young guy. He actually wanted Rosemary to create a will that didn't have Courtney in it to make sure she wouldn't get his stuff, his daughter would get his stuff. And there's a couple articles that I read that will be linked in the description, they may be popping up on your screen, that you can read about it yourself. It's best that they just go away with everybody thinking everything was fine than for them to suffer the humiliation of that rejection. If Kurt Cobain would have publicly rejected these people, people would have forgot their names in a heartbeat. Imagine the headlines if Kurt and Courtney's divorce went through. Kristen hooks up with Kurt, and then the headlines. Kristen leaves Eric, Kurt leaves Courtney. Now they're together, this power duo of actual professional musicians. Courtney and Eric would have been a side note in the music in rock history. I don't even know if they would have made it as a side note. It would have been Kurt and Kristen. Courtney knows that by Kurt dying, she becomes the executor of the Cobain estate, which she did. She gains the publishing rights to Nirvana, and she actually ends up selling the rights after she gains them, by the way. I'm gonna make a whole separate video on all the times Courtney Love has sold Kurt Cobain's likeness, sold his music. She controls DGC, right? Because now, instead of Kurt being in control of his music, Courtney's in control of his music. So DGC, David Geffen, has to kiss her ass, not Kurt's. Eric and Courtney, Courtney the most, had the most to gain and the most to lose. I'm not letting these other little pukes off the hook. I'm just saying the two people who had the most to gain and the most to lose is Courtney and Eric. Now let's continue with the timeline because we're going to get to the motives, the evidence, the connections. We're going to get to all that. I promise you we're going to be all over the place in the next episode. I'm just trying to finish the timeline right now. So we know Courtney sends Erlinson, who's like a lovesick puppy and will do anything she says to look for her husband that he's quite jealous over the same day he dies. Yes, Kristen Pfaff is Kurt's admirer, and yes, I will have an episode about her. I, I haven't forgotten about it. I'm just trying to make sense of this day right now. Courtney sends Eric to the house, and when later, when Tom finds out, well, why did you send Eric? She says, oh, well, it turns out Kurt had been seen at the house, but Callie never told me until April 5th. We know that Callie and Jessica had a conversation with Kurt the morning of April 2nd. Hopper never denied that. Callie will say, oh, I thought it was a dream. I was unsure if he was really in my bedroom or not, which is awful funny because he tells Dylan Carlson that he specifically remembers speaking to Kurt. When Cobain returned to his Madrona home, he found his former nanny, Michael DeWitt, whose nickname is Callie, staying there. I talked to Callie. This is a quote from Dylan Carlson. 
I talked to Callie, who said he had seen Kurt on Saturday, April 2nd, says Carlson, adding that DeWitt described Cobain as ill, as looking ill and acting weird, but I couldn't get a hold of him myself. So not only does Callie admit to seeing and speaking with Kurt, his senses were awake enough for him to describe Kurt as looking ill and acting weird. Yet, as we're going to find out, he goes ahead and tells everybody else, tells everybody else, as if covering for Courtney, who never told Tom Kurt was seen at the house. Oh, I, actually, I didn't tell Courtney. Courtney never told you that Kurt was at the house because I never told her until the 5th. And then Courtney says, well, at that point on the 5th, when Callie, you know, I realized Kurt had been seen three days earlier and Callie never told me, I didn't trust him anymore. So I sent Eric. Supposedly Eric went to the house and, and um, Hopper's there. Callie's not there. Uh, Hopper does run into Erlinson, but no Kurt. They don't search the greenhouse. Basically, Kurt was at the house on the second. Callie and Hopper claimed that they never told Courtney until the fifth. And then because they never told Courtney, Courtney claims she sent Eric there on the fifth. And this is Courtney's reasoning for sending a third party to the home to look for Kurt. Callie DeWitt and Jessica Hopper even later claimed that on the 5th, they got into an argument with each other on whether Kurt was an apparition or not on the 2nd. Hopper saying, no, he was really there. And supposedly DeWitt saying, well, I thought that was a dream. I didn't know that was really him. Supposedly, guys. Seems like a whole lot of covering up to me. Very unusual because as we know, Hopper has a totally different story saying that we tried calling Courtney, Courtney was aware that he had been there and she's never questioned. These people are never questioned. There's all these inconsistencies, all these coincidences and the mother are never questioned. Why? We're gonna get to that. Proceeding, I'm going to be using some clips from the documentary Soaked in Bleach, Montani Productions, and believe me, I have paid my dues. Keep in mind that Tom had an audio recording device in his pocket, so this isn't a script that someone wrote. These are the actual words between them, their conversations. Uh, the second thing is, Tom had been asking since day one for Courtney to pay the expenses for him to move the investigation to Seattle. After all, it's much easier to find somebody as a private investigator if you're in the same city they're in. She had denied him every single day up until the day after we know Kurt has died. I thought that you said that you, you didn't want Kurt no, to... I, Tom. Okay, um, listen, if he's not there, then I think we need to set up a team at the Lake Washington house. Yeah, it's a waste of time, Tom, you know what? He's, he's not gonna be there. Is there a reason that you don't want surveillance on your house? Yes, because we don't need it. Callie's there. He'll tell me if Kurt shows up. So here we have a woman who's playing with her husband's money, who's a millionaire, and does not want to pay for Tom to go to the same city that they know he's in. This is something that's never happened in Tom's career, that somebody wanted him to find someone but didn't want him to go to where they were last spotted and she's canceled the credit card back in the 90s data systems were very primitive everybody knew once you canceled a credit card the only thing that it would record is the purchase and the day that they tried to make the purchase it doesn't tell you the city the state the even the business location only that it was declined and for the amount of money it was declined on what day it was declined couple that with the fact that on april 5th courtney love went from ranting and raving any chance she got to tom grant to being very quiet to the point where the next day on april 6th he goes to her hotel room to see if she's disappeared he notes that courtney seems very calm she's not her crazy ranting frantic this is a part of the story that i'm sure most of you if not all of you know tom takes the next flight to seattle but by the time he gets to SeaTac airport rents a car catches up with dylan carlson who courtney has told him to get with it's after dark not only is it after dark it's raining as it does nine nine and a half months out of the year in seattle tom meets up with dylan they go to a diner they sit down to eat and discuss where kurt could be where does kurt hang out 
let's go check out all of his usual spots. This conversation with Dylan is the first time that Tom Grant learns about the fact that Kurt likes to disappear into the Aurora Strip. While I was in Seattle with Dylan and we were driving around, I mentioned to him that Courtney said that Kurt only stays in the best hotels and he was almost incredulous. I mean, he practically laughed and he said, that's ridiculous. He hates fancy hotels. He stays in really cheap places, mostly along the Aurora Strip. He also expresses to Dylan all the concerns that Courtney had. This is where Tom's thoughts go from suspicions to actual concerns. Dylan starts contradicting what Courtney's saying. Dylan's saying, I don't know why Kurt married her. He's told me that he's miserable with Courtney. All they ever do is fight. And Tom says, well, what about being suicidal? Why would you buy him a shotgun if you knew he was suicidal? Dylan says, Kurt's not suicidal. He's never once mentioned suicide to me. This thing in Rome. Did anybody say that that may have been him trying to kill himself? No. It was an accident. Everybody knows that. I asked him several times about whether Kurt was suicidal or not, and it was almost a joke to him. You know, it was like, no, of course not. They had a recent burglary at the Lake Washington house. There had been people walking up on his property trying to peek in his windows, paparazzi trying to get pictures of his baby. He wanted to get a gun just to scare people away. And for, and for protection, to protect his little girl. Kurt grew up in a rural area which he himself called rednecky, and he was very familiar with guns. Now, I had a conversation the other day with a subscriber from England, and it completely shocked and baffled me that people aren't allowed to own guns there. In America, this is an everyday part of our lives. I myself, I myself grew up in a home where shotguns hung on the wall. A short story about Kurt's childhood will let us know how familiar he was with guns. Kurt's first guitar came from his uncle, but his first really good amp, a vintage PV, actually came from a pawn shop after he hawked his stepfather's guns. When Cobain was 17, his mother married Pat O'Connor, whose ensuing infidelity led to a situation that greatly facilitated Cobain's acquisition of musical gear. After Cobain's mother learned that Pat, his stepfather, was cheating on her, she dumped his gun collection in the river. So it wasn't a pond, it was a river. Cobain observed his mother's antics and later encouraged some of the neighborhood kids to fish his stepdad's weapons out. Cobain sold the guns and bought a used PV vintage amplifier with two 12-inch speakers with the proceeds. And any aspiring musicians out there, you younger kids who want those three, four, ten thousand dollar guitars or whatever, Kurt Cobain, even after he could afford the very best, still used low-budget guitars. It's not about the guitar, it's about who's playing the guitar. Kurt is not this weak, feeble, cowardly, artsy-fartsy kind of guy who's afraid of his own shadow that Courtney Love would like for you to think he was. He was very familiar with weapons. He shot them his whole life. When him and Dylan went to purchase the weapon, they purposefully purchased a 20-gauge shotgun with birdshot. It's called Light Load. It literally pepper sprays its targets. You can shoot someone with it at relatively close range, 15, 20 yards, and all it's going to do is burn their ass alive. But it's not going to kill you. Now, sure, at short range, it could kill you, but that's not the purpose of a 20 gauge. If he really just wanted to kill himself, he would have purchased a 12 or a 16 gauge shotgun. Kurt was very familiar with weapons. He knew what he was doing with them. Because I'm thinking, if he was as suicidal as she says he is, why would she let him buy a shotgun? He's not suicidal. He bought that shotgun the day he went to rehab. Been a burglary at the house recently. The police had just confiscated his other gun, so I registered it in my name. Trust me, if he was suicidal, I would never let him get a shotgun. I bet my bottom dollar that any man or woman 
watching this right now who grew up in a rural area, especially if they grew up on a farm, if you grew up in the country, you know what I mean when I say a man is expected to protect his family. Once you have a baby, one of the first things you're supposed to do is get a gun. That's like a rite of passage. You guys know that Kurt came out of a rural, rednecky area. That would have been ingrained in his mind. I have a daughter, I need protection, I buy a gun. As well, you gotta remember, Kurt was a huge fan of the Beatles. Look at what happened to John Lennon. People in the early 90s were beginning to call Nirvana the new Beatles, Nirvana mania, just like they called it Beatles mania. So Kurt being a huge fan of the Beatles would be thinking, oh crap, I'm being called a spokesman for a generation. So was John Lennon and look at what happened to him. Lennon like Cobain, made himself very accessible to fans. Lennon was shot by Mark Chapman right outside his apartment building. I believe it's called Dakota Apartment Complex in Manhattan, in New York. Mark Chapman comes up to John Lennon with the latest Beatles album. Lennon autographs it for him. Later that night, after returning from a recording session with his wife, Yoko Ono, Chapman had been waiting for him, shoots him right outside of his home. Where were these people bothering Kurt Cobain? Right outside of his home. There had been a burglary, people trying to get in his windows, peek in his windows. It would have definitely been on Kurt's mind. Lennon's assassination would have definitely been on Kurt's mind. So Kurt's thinking defensive. He's thinking protection. And Dylan reinforces that. As I said, it was late in the evening on April 6th when Tom Grant finally hooked up with Dylan. They did go to the house. Dylan doesn't show him the greenhouse. They search the house. They, of course, do not find Jessica Hopper because Callie sent Jessica Hopper away earlier that day. Callie himself is not there. He's been making himself scarce since the 4th, one day before Kurt is dead. So it's all just very strange that Michael Callie DeWitt and Jessica Hopper, who were supposed to be on the lookout for Kurt, looking out for his well-being and are very content in their own little world doing their drugs inside of Kurt Cobain's house the entire time that Courtney and Kurt are gone. But then all of a sudden, right around his death, they make themselves scares and vanish. After searching the house, they go out to the diner, they discuss where Kurt could be, they check a few motels, and then they call it a night. It was a dark, rainy, gray night. I've only been to Seattle once in my life, stayed there for a couple weeks with some friends. I never knew that there were those shades of gray that exist. Like, Seattle can be a very, very dark, gloomy place, especially when it's raining. It's worth mentioning that during the week of April 2nd to April 8th, the Seattle Police Department had went to Kurt's house twice and not searched the greenhouse. A lot, I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, matter of fact, the police didn't even bother to go inside the house. There were workers, probably a landscaping company that was contracted to take care of the grounds. There were workers outside. The police asked the workers if Kurt been around. They said no, and the police just left. They didn't even bother knocking on the door. It is also worth mentioning, and I can't believe I almost forgot this, Jessica Hopper leaves on April 6th, suddenly. Matter of fact, later she says that she had been really, really sick those last couple days in Seattle. And, you know, people usually don't get on airplanes and take trips while they're sick, right? They wait till they recuperate. Callie had just called her a car from the limo company that Kurt was known to use, sent her to the airport, and away she went. Only one day after we know Kurt died. No explanation. Callie just says, you're leaving today. Bye. So there really hasn't been a day since Tom Grant met Courtney Love that something suspicious didn't happen. But later, Tom will find out a lot of things about April 7th that really don't add up. The first of those being Callie leaves. Courtney herself calls Callie a ride. Supposedly, Callie's job is to be a live-in nanny and to house sit when her and Kurt are out of town. But suddenly, she sends Callie away. She will later claim that Callie went to rehab and that she gave Callie $35,000 for rehab. There are a lot of questions I have for Dylan and Callie, especially Callie, who spent more time here at the house than anybody last week. Um, 
Kelly is a, he just left for rehab. He's in El Paso or um, Georgia, I think. Um, no, 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 he's in LA with friends. Now, earlier in the week, Tom Grant has her recorded in a phone conversation talking about how if her and Kurt get a divorce, she's going to lose her publishing deal with David Geffen Company, and she's going to have money problems. But all of a sudden, she's just giving people money for rehab. $35,000 worth of money. I mean, money's not a problem. I mean, money is a problem. I mean, if we, you know, if we get a divorce and I don't have my publishing deal, money will be a problem, but that's not going to happen for quite some time. What happened to those money problems? If we're to believe that she has nothing to do with this, it's April 7th, one day before Kurt's body's found, she should be expecting a divorce. She's telling Tom he wants a divorce, I'm going to have money issues, I'm going to probably lose my publishing deal, he's not going to be there to tell his people at David Geppin to release my record. Shouldn't she be expecting money problems? But it doesn't seem to me like she's expecting money problems on April 7th when you're giving away $35,000 to the nanny. Now, whether he actually went to rehab or not, no one knows. Medical files aren't public knowledge. Like, a court would have to subpoena your medical record in any facility you go to. And the Seattle police never investigated. So no one actually knows if Callie really went to rehab or not. And even if he did, how much, how long he stayed there and how much it would have cost. What we do know, is on April 7th, Courtney calls him a car, he takes off, doesn't come back, and he's got 35 grand in his pocket. Now comes the evening of the 7th, and even more strange things happen. Tom and Dylan are out scouring more motels, going up to the clerk saying, have you seen Kurt Cobain? Have you seen Kurt Cobain? Dylan decides he wants to check in with Courtney. He calls Courtney from a payphone, and there is some drama with Courtney back in LA. I don't want to talk about it because it was all lies that she concocted and put in the press. But the interesting thing is Tom realizes that Courtney has began speaking through Dylan and giving instructions to him through Dylan. Courtney cuts off communication. I'm going to call Courtney and check in. I don't know what's going on. Courtney always wanted to go through Dylan. She wanted to talk to Dylan on the phone and have Dylan give me the instructions. Now, later, Rosemary Carroll says that when Dylan called Courtney from that payphone that night, she heard Courtney specifically tell Dylan, make sure he checks the greenhouse. This is something that the attorney for Kurt Cobain tells Tom Grant later. Courtney's instructions are to go back to the house, that there's a secret compartment where the shotgun may be. This event, when Tom goes back to the house, they do not find the shotgun, but it sets off another series of events that raises even more suspicion. It's almost as if Courtney Love thinks that she's being really smart, but she's actually leaving a breadcrumb trail right back to her and Eric and Dylan, and Callie, and Hopper. First things first, they enter the home right on the staircase is the infamous note left by Callie DeWitt, in which he says, oh man, Courtney's so worried about you, she's freaking out, you're an asshole, why haven't you contacted her? I can't believe that you've been in this house without me seeing you. Well, that's interesting because Callie claims from the fourth on he had made himself very, very scarce, he was constantly gone for hours on end. So if that's true, why would you think it's weird that you and Court, you and Kurt did not cross paths? Are you telling us that you weren't constantly gone for hours at a time? That you were in the house 24-7? The second thing is Tom does find the Rohypnol underneath the mattress. They take the sheets off the bed. They flip the mattress. They... they turn the pillowcases inside out they do a number on this bed right they wreck it and all they find is rohypnol pills later courtney love will insist that kurt cobain left her a second suicide note 
meaning he would have had to have left it the night of the 4th or the morning of the 5th. Kurt left her a note under her pillow. On the 7th, the day before Kurt's body's found, Tom ripped that bed apart. There was no note there. He catches Courtney in yet another lie. Kurt could not have left a note after Tom ripped the bed apart. You mentioned in Rolling Stone about another note that he wrote to you. It's like a letter, yeah. but it's not really like a suicide note. It's like, it seems more like it was like a, it was a sealed envelope, and it was just like to me, and it seems like he wrote it in rehab. Where'd you um, find it? Where'd it, you was get in it? My, it was in my bedroom under my pillows. Under your pillows? Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't tell anybody about it, but Rosemary and uh, I told Sergeant Cameron about it. Yeah. I let him see it. There's so, only one problem with that, Courtney. What? I looked under your pillows, just like what? we looked under your mattresses. That's there. how I found the rope, the rope note between your mattresses. That note wasn't under your pillows on the bed. Even more, Rosemary Carroll will also come forward and tell Tom that the night of the 6th and the 7th that Courtney was at her home, when she talked to Dylan on the phone, she left a backpack at Rosemary Carroll's house, and inside that backpack was a notebook and random loose papers where it was obvious that she had been tracing and practicing Kurt Cobain's handwriting. Maybe if you could come over again? Yeah, that's there's some fine. Stuff I want to show you. Yeah, okay. I don't know. I, I just there's some stuff I was left at my house yeah. that I never thought to really look at. Yeah. To look at at all, quite honestly, until last night. Uh huh. She left it after she came over to my house the night of the sixth. Rosemary Carroll was working with me behind the scenes, privately, giving me information. She did it out of a good conscience. What do you think that is? I think someone went through his notebook found passages that could plausibly be cobbled together to a suicide and traced them. Like they were traced? Mm, yeah. yeah. Or forged or something like that. Well, are you, are you taping this call? I tape all my calls. Oh, shit. Tom. The next morning on April 8th, Vecca Electric responding to the phone call Courtney Love had made the previous day her call for service to have those security lights, cameras, and alarms be put up around her greenhouse. They answer that call. They come to install everything she has ordered. And Gary Smith, the electrician, finds Kurt Cobain's body. That's where we're going to end this video. And if you've watched the whole series, you know that we have now come full circle all the way back to the beginning. Now we can concentrate on the aftermath of Kurt's death, how it affected the his worldwide fans. We can talk about Courtney's connections and all the key players that took part in the so-called two-minute investigation. You know, I always seem to overestimate or underestimate how long these videos are going to be, how long it's going to take me to do them. So I'm just going to stop doing that. I'm just going to stop saying anything and just put them out when they're done. I hope that you guys have enjoyed everything so far. There's still a lot to talk about. There's We, we haven't even actually got into the evidence yet. I'm going to have another long video for the ending of the Nirvana series, and then we will immediately move on to Alice in Chains, which I've already started working on. I hope that you guys like the video. I hope you hit that subscribe button, and leave me a like. If you want to become a member, hit the join button, and uh, that's about it.